Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, that's a post-lunch response, if I've ever heard one. So thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Mark Nemec, and I am president and CEO of Eduventures, which is actually a Boston-based research advisory firm which works with 400 higher education institutions and others who serve them, foundations and agencies, to basically navigate the current constraints of higher education and figure out what's next. Um, and we do that particularly in the areas of recruitment and retention online and academic pro program development so that those institutions might better serve their students as well as society at large. So I come here because serendipitously I happen to be working with our colleagues at LSU as well as the University of South Alabama this week and I thought it would be a good opportunity to speak on this scorecard because in addition to the research we've done as a firm as well as um, the visits I have with leaders. I happen to be a former academic myself, having focused on the societal role of higher education and political development. And it's with that lens, actually all three of those lenses, our research, my conversations with leaders around the country, as well as some historical perspective, that I want to offer a few thoughts. Three thoughts and two very specific cautions in regards to the rating system. The first thought is that one thing we have to keep in mind, and to be honest, I feel it's being missed in this conversation, is the extent to which the non-traditional learner, those who are 25 to 44, returning to school, are the new majority. Everything in this conversation tends to center around the 18 to 24 year old. That's where we hear this myth about US falling behind in degree completion. Well, yes, we are falling behind in degree completion for 18, 24 year olds. But actually, if you look at the OECD data correctly and incorporate 25 to 44 year olds, the US still maintains a leadership position. In fact, we are the world leaders in adult education. And yet somehow that is missed in the conversation. Secondly, in that regard, I want to talk about this issue of cost. It's not a cost concern. It's a value concern. And there is real concern there. As we do studies of college graduates, what's notable is that that concern is related to the amount of debt they take on. But what's interesting is that there's actually a tipping point. We've recently done a study looking at the amount of debt students have taken on and whether they believe their college degree was worth the money. The tipping point is $20,000. Unfortunately, the average debt load now is $24,000, if not more. How much of a tipping point? If you took on between ten dollars and $20,000 worth of debt, 50, only 15% of students said the degree wasn't worth the cost. Once you got over 20, it was 56%. So this question of value has to be considered, and that's where aspects of technology and thinking of technology not as a cost center, but instead of a way of expanding access as a multi-channel institution is critical. Additionally, I think it's also important to note my third point is that as we are thinking about this concept of value, the ROI that individual students are calculating as are their parents, utility is at the forefront. We do the single largest survey of co rising college juniors or high school juniors and seniors. And what we found is that for the first time ever, and we've been doing this survey now for 20 plus 20 years, is that job preparation is the single biggest driver and determinant in college choice. More than academics, more than campus environment, we're second and third, and more than affordability. Right? And even during the Great Recession, that was not what we were seeing. But, and these are my cautions, they're twofold. We cannot assume this moment in time where we're focusing on utility is everything we need to pivot higher education around. And that is where I get concerned with the metrics that are being proposed. Why? Well, first and foremost, as Dr. Wilson said first at the, in the very first speech, the diversity of approach that American higher education has taken is our greatest strength. And I think there's a fundamental misreading of history if we move to standardization. I know the president in, his, uh, in one of the debates referenced the Murill Act as a great standardized approach. But in fact, the Murill Act was a great diversified approach. The Murill Act, not to get too much into a history lesson, actually were grants of land that the states could sell at their discretion and set up institutions that had the broad mandate of supporting education in the applied and mechanic arts. But notably, it led to such diverse institutions as Michigan State, Penn State, which are traditional um, land-grant schools, but Cornell and Ithaca. And in fact, the state legislator of Connecticut basically used the grant to set up the Sheffield Scientific School at Yale. Diversity of approach has always been our greatest strength, and it's something that any rating scheme has to take into account. And then lastly, and most fundamentally, is that when we are talking about outcomes, yes, we need to be discussing outcomes because we can no longer take the leap of faith that by simply having more access or better curriculum and faculty that we're going to get the best outcomes. But when talking about outcomes, if we are only thinking about individualized outcomes, we are completely underserving what higher education means for this country. In a very Tocquevillian perspective, higher education is the single biggest determinant of civic capital. 
right? All the political line, science literature shows that likelihood to vote, likelihood to volunteer, likelihood to be engaged in your community is determined not by income, but by level of education. And if we're only talking about higher education in terms of what the individual benefit is in terms of their career and their earnings, we're basically not calculating some of the largest aspects of that investment in why American higher education has been a world leader and needs to continue to be one going forward. Thank you for the time. Thank you.